Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Hope you and everyone you care about are staying safe. Sorry it took some time to get this episode. What's really cool now is that Peter's film, A Song for Us, is now available for rent on Vimeo On Demand, which I think is incredible because when he told me about the project he wanted to do years ago, I thought it was an incredibly ambitious undertaking. So for me, it's just really cool and really amazing that he got everything done and the film is out in the world now. So check it out at asongforus.com and we will get into the production of the film. But right now, we continue with Peter's journey as he's finished his stint working on the Thunderbirds and leaves his home country of England. So I came over in 67 and uh, I, I didn't know anybody. I had a hundred pounds to my name, um, and I, I I I just walked up and down, you know, downtown, and I walked up Young Street, and I went to this pub, and uh, I I I was thirsty, and I said to the guy, "Can I have a lemonade and lime?" And the guy said, "Why don't you try? Can he? Oh no, do you have a passport?" And I, I this, this, apparently you have to be. 21 or something and that's proof so I never did that I used to drink beer in, at 15 and um, in a pub and uh, the guy said well wait till the girls come and uh, there was a Zanzibar tavern that I ended up being in I didn't realize so Famous, I man. sort of stumbled up Young Street you know uh, popping into a few other bars and and I ended up on Yorkville about 11 o'clock at night and that and and, the, and the girl, I asked the girl well, you know, where there's a, a coffee bar and I found this place called the Penny Farthing and I went in there and the, the lady was English and uh, she told me, come back in the morning, love, and I'll show you where to get a room. And uh, so I got a room there and uh, then with, with, with the room was like 10 bucks a week on Bernard Avenue and I ended up uh, within three weeks working for the CBC. And how old, how old were you when you came over? Uh, oh, right. I was uh, t- uh, 21. Oh, okay. So you could legally. Yeah, well, but almost twenty-two, actually. Yeah, just at the end of that, the, being twenty-one. Um, and uh, so I worked for the CBC, um, and uh, I made my first short film uh, working there with a with a, a, a cameraman who's a great director now called Vic Saran, and shot that. And I actually used music from Crocker Harm illegally, and. Uh, uh, I actually, then I met the Procol Harum playing, and I said I, I made a film, and they came over to my my flat, and uh, they, uh, they 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 got to see this little short film. It's not very good, I mean, but it was me trying to learn how to edit and and do all the different angles and things like that. Um, and and uh, that's my first start. It's actually feel, feeling that I could actually be a filmmaker. When you first came to Canada, you didn't intend to stay. Right, you said you didn't know anybody. No, I was. Uh, I, I my, actually, my uncle was a doctor from uh, British Guiana, and uh, he sponsored me to come over here. And he he uh, lived out in uh, Saskatchewan uh, uh, in a, a small town called uh, Bigger. And uh, uh, so when I came over, I didn't have anybody to come to. Uh, but the idea was, well, I'll get a job here. And I'll go and start traveling the world, you know. I mean, it was that that kind of like oh. But then I guess I I, I also had two minds. I had the other mind. Well, I should really get get a job and do something. And and I I know that talking to the directors that I'd worked with in England, I could, if I want to be a director, they said you better learn editing. And and so I that's why I went and tried to get a job as as an editor or, or a trainee editor at the time because I. I had I I didn't edit I you know I knew how to move work a movieola type of thing but that was it um, uh, so uh, the, it was the it was the, that started it all right you know it was the was the beginning of, of my life again uh, in in sixty seven and uh, uh, it was the it was the opportunity that that I really needed to to, to be a filmmaker uh, so. Thank, thank goodness the CBC was there. And CBC, I usually find like you know, people you know when they when they when they get a job there, they kind of stay there. Um, you didn't do that. Was there a reason behind that? Did you just or like was um, the lure of LA just too much? Well, 
No, well, I think I was there, but it wasn't. Things weren't moving very fast for me. I was going to be stuck there for the rest of my life, and and it just it just didn't. I wasn't, you know, I was still a, an assistant editor after about a year, and I, you know, I think young people get kind of impatient quicker, you know. And this guy came in looking for a, a, a guy like myself. Um, who could do a bit of editing and and stuff, and I did it as a, 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 a sports show and things like that at that time. And uh, I, I, uh, they offered me this job at this uh, this uh, commercial company uh, called, um, gee, what was it called? But it was owned by Sal Magda. And uh, the other guy was Noel Dodds, who was a director, a producer, and I ended up eventually working for him as well as a cameraman and editor. Uh, but uh, I. I uh, I didn't I, I I guess I just took that took my chances. The money was certainly a little bit better than what the CBC was playing. Um, and then after that, um, I I uh, I got laid off from there, and I opened up a photo studio on Yorkville, and uh, with a with a with a guy who who was uh, had his own equipment, and I learned photography. Uh, from he had a Hasselblad in the dark room, and I learned dark room work and things like that. Uh, but I was still really struggling at that point again. I, you know, I, I, I had regular pay, pay, and then all of a sudden I wasn't getting regular pay. And uh, uh, I, I did go off and work for a few other companies as an editor, of course. But uh, there was a, there was definitely periods in my life where uh, I was quite quite worried. But I, I would just say to everybody, there is a there 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 is uh, there is a path that that you don't know that you're going to go on to, but you just have to really uh, be determined and stick to it and and keep positive. And uh, you never wasted my never lost my my use in my time, you know. Right, right, right. And then um, I I uh, was talking to a, a writer. And he 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 was going to go to down to LA to get married, and I started thinking, this is kind of nice. Like LA is really warm; it's got palm trees. He was telling me and things like that. And I thought, oh, gee, why why shouldn't I be there? That's where filmmakers are supposed to go, right? You know, we basically uh, I packed up, sold up, sold everything, and uh, drove drove down there myself. Found a place. I first went to. Uh, San Francisco to see if I could get work, and there was a guy that was running the National Film Board was trying to help me, and uh, that that I couldn't get any work in San Francisco, so I I drove down to uh, L.A. and uh, I knew one guy to a guy called Gary Top, who was his cousin. He said, you should call him, and he was a camera assistant, and he said, well, uh, he's working with Wes Craven. Uh, on the Hills of Eyes, and he said, they, they're, they're, they're looking for some sound editing work. I, I, I said, okay, great. So I, I went there, and uh, I didn't get the, 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 the account, but they met a guy in the elevator who did, and I gave, gave him my card, and he, he hired me to work on other films as well, doing, doing sound editing and dialogue editing. What films did, he, did you uh, end up working with him on? Uh, well, this is um, uh, the first one was The Hills of Eyes, Oh, I thought you said you didn't get hired on that. No, the, the, but the guy that was in the elevator uh, did get the job, and uh, he hired me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it shows you, you know, you never know. You just keep, you keep, keep smiling, right? You've got a lucky face, mate, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, I just, um, I, I just, uh, there was uh, something called Bears with Michael Caine. I can't remember all the pictures. Um, Malibu Beach was another one. It was a dialogue editor uh, on as well. And, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, there was uh, another one that was really, oh, there was a, a, a TV series I got hired as the, uh, um, the, the guy to, to supervise the editing. And in actual fact, I just was the editor in the end. But um, it was uh, the hilt, it's called um, Camp Wilderness. And uh, it was a it was serious where they would get sponsors. So if they've got twelve bikes, sponsor you know to to throw into the into the show or something, well, I I had to c- come up with an idea, write write a script about 
you know, 12 bikes and, uh, uh, and, yeah, and, like go off, and I went off and filmed it and I shot it. And then, you know, I had a hot air balloon and I would I'd go up and shoot the hot air balloon and we had skiing up in Mammoth and, and, and it was like a wilderness type show, but it was just had a story with kids who went to camp and it used to start off with a, an old timer telling a story and, or one of them telling a story. And then you go into, into the, into the actual drama, right. You know, and uh, so that that went okay for for a while, and uh, and then I ended up working uh, on a film called Raw, uh, which actually was Tippy Hedren. Like I'm, I'm not I'm related to Alfred Hitchcock as a second cousin, but it wasn't because of that. It's just uh, because I had some experience, um, and uh, so I, I got hired as a picture editor. And Jan de Bont, who was a, a t- director of photographer uh, on the on the on the shoot. Um, uh, was uh, was 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 there also, um, and Noel Marshall, who directed it, was the producer of um, uh, Gee, this game. Uh, yeah. I have to look. I, I wish I had. Because Roar is quite infamous now, or maybe yeah, and... yeah. Uh, it, well, th- that's right, and uh, it was it was kind of you know, there was a scene I was cutting on a three-picture-headed cam. Uh, oh, Noel Marshall. There you go. See if it's a brain on delay now. Noel Marshall produced uh, The Exorcist, and uh, so that's that's that was his claim to fame. And I went up to the, the ranch on Soledad Canyon to to, to meet meet them, and uh, they had all these wild animals around there, and these uh, these animals. Um, uh, you know, it was it was it was it was quite amazing what they were doing. They were running around these animals doing this film, Jan de Bont had like sometimes five, five cameras to shoot it. And he got uh, hit by a, a lion scratch, scratched his skull. Uh, uh, I think Noel Marshall's son uh, got, got, um, got a couple of bites from the, the animal and Melanie Griffiths was, uh, was in it as well. And so uh, I was cutting all the scenes and then Noel Marshall got bit uh on the leg after doing it like i think his 50th take or something like that and and uh he went to hospital and he he had to come out and rescue his, his ranch because his ranch got flooded and all the animals were escaping i mean it's one of those like it it, it was an amazing story behind the behind the scenes uh and anyway i i uh I, I, they, they had a million feet of film to to edit and uh the three picture headed Ken. Was was I never worked on a, on a three picture headed cam before, but it's another thing you learn, right? You know. So what year did you get? Like how many years did you stay in Canada? Well, nineteen seventy six to nineteen seventy nine, or something, seventy eight, something like that. Yeah, I should write this timeline down, shouldn't I? I I, I keep meaning to do that. It's a really good thing to do. It's a a timeline every year. What did I accomplish? You know. Yeah, yeah. What no, went no. wrong? You know. Okay, so you were in LA for like three years ish. Something like that. Yeah, two, two and a half, three years. Yeah, I mean, it was sort of like it got to the point where we had to put the kids into school. I mean, it's really that was it. So mm. it's probably more like I probably two years. I, you know, but it was the idea that we had to make a decision to stay or go, and uh, and uh, it seemed that you know, I mean, LA was really nice. I really liked Venice, and then we lived in West Hollywood in a nice little bungalow and had orange and lemon trees in the back garden and avocados dropping from the front. I mean, it was all very delightful. The helicopters flying overhead, the gunshots in the background, um, you know, driving to a store, not walking, you couldn't walk safely, and, and, and things like that were kind of like, you know, I didn't really want to be in America, uh, you know, because it wasn't really... I don't know. It was there were nice people and stuff like that. Uh, I liked the whole the whole creative side of it. I loved the feeling that you know you go into a restaurant, you can hear people talking film, and you can see they've got the Hollywood Reporter and the, uh, you know and the variety magazines on the in boxes on the corner. I mean, just like it was a film town. It was an amazing place for a, a filmmaker to be. But uh, when you've got a family. Um, you need you need a place to go where it's a little bit more sane, you know. Wow, so even LA even back then was like that. Yeah, yeah. Um just it was it was kind of weird seeing these helicopters with searchlights uh flying overhead and then you'd yeah, bing bing bing, you know, <laughs> uh, better stay indoors now, you know. 
<laughs> right, Jesus, okay. Was... And there was an earthquake that we went through too, uh, that was not too severe, but it kind of sh- shook us, so to speak. So, right, we, you know, it makes you kind of wonder, you know, is the gas line going to break, it going to explode, or whatever, you know. Now, what else do you remember about the Hills of Eyes? Because that, that's sort of like a classic horror movie now, right? Well, yeah, I, I can tell you. Like when, it, when I went to see what they, they would call as the, the final edit, I guess, you know, uh, uh, but it was still, edit, it still had splices in it. And you could see the cellar tape hold going through and things like that. It was, um, it, I, I didn't really think it was like that great a picture, right? You know, and uh, just to get the job was just fine, you know. And uh, then I, I started to really take the film seriously in terms of the sound aspects of it. And, uh, you know, we were making our own sound. sound. I had a, a Nagra and I, I, I went up to uh, Griffiths Park because uh, I had to bash melons, uh, you know, for the guy's head being hit and things like that, you know. And, and uh, we didn't have, it was like a low budget film, of course, right, too. Um, and so I created a lot of the sound effects as well. Um, the the, the, uh, the then it just started to grow on you. You start to then you went to, to mix it, and you know Wes Craven was there, and uh, uh, it was really nice to me. And uh, I, I I got a feeling that I'd done a good job, right? You know, and there was other there was another sound editor there uh, with me doing work as well, and I I worked on Foley. I should say just stepping back. I worked on Foley, um, uh, creating some of the, the effects as well. Um, and uh, uh, when I got into MGM uh, a studio, you kind of tr- go in and drive in, and you go into the restaurant. You see all these film stars in there, and you and you go into the mix. And, and when they mix it, it's like a big. You've got a big cinema, and you've got uh, you know a, a, a big control panel. And they mix the sound at the same time. They mix the sound. One guy's handling the sound effects, another guy's handling the music, another guy's handling the uh, the dialogue, and, it, and that's how they get it out quickly, I guess. And uh, it was a great experience. It, it really was. And uh, uh, I got a feeling that Wes, Wes Craven, uh, you know, uh, thought I did a good job. Uh, because so that's, that because 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 of the amount of work that we put into the sound. Um, in, in fact, um, I just remembered that the Hollywood Reporter actually mentioned that the sound sounded like sense around. Um, so the, the 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 sound job that I did, I think, really helped helped the picture a lot. Right, right. And what what did you get credited with on that film? Sound effects editor. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, that was fine. You know. That's my second job in LA, you know. So. Oh wait, what was the first one? I thought that was your first. one. Oh, uh, the first, the f- first one. It was with a, a Michael Caine movie. Oh. Um, yeah, I can't remember. It's called Michael Caine. And also in the. Yeah, but that was Sinking Rushes. Oh. That was just Sinking Rushes. That's all that was. So something called a bear. Something with the word bears in it. Oh, up later, yeah. I, I tell you, he's a really pleasant guy to 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 to, to work for. So uh, I think that's another key in this: is that you really have to be a you know a nice human being, and and uh, everybody kind of doesn't kind of likes to to work with you. You know. Right, right. Yeah. What was your re- working relationship with him like? It was it was um, it, it, but it was just encouraging. I mean, you just there was uh, there was not a lot of involvement in doing this in coming doing the sound i mean he didn't really hear the sound until the, the actual mix right you know oh yeah that's true like back then yeah yeah um and it was all you know they had all these different tracks and you know the you know they were you know, that to set the volume and things like that it's not like we we can do it now on the computer right you know <laughs> right, all, right. all held with sellotape right you know <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and we would use loops and things like that. And you know, uh, the sound effects were for the dogs were um, were just electrical wire uh, that sort of in sand because the, the scene was shot near um, uh, an air force base. So there were, that some of the sound had to be replaced there. They when he broke the neck of a, a, a caged canary. Or, um, 
uh, or Finch. Uh, it was uh, I, I used celery. You know, I had to break up celery, but I had to come up with the ideas. I mean, I didn't. I didn't actually get trained at film school uh, to do uh, to, to do sound effects. It was like, you know, use your imagination, Peter. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, like, and that's kind of like the best way to learn. You know, it's just like. You, you know, someone's paying you and you have a job to do and you're a smart guy, so you're going to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I, I would I would say go and make a film first before going to film school. You know, find out all how difficult it is, how you have to plan a, a day to shoot, uh, uh, how how the, the, the script actually works, how the story works, how you tell it, you know, um, uh, and and then make it, Five ten minutes. Don't don't try to do anything bigger than that. Make several of them, you know, uh, and maybe uh, it is. But put your money into your film, not into the into going to school, you know. Right, right. Like, as you never but went to school for filmmaking at all. I never went to school at all. No, I did um, later on. I did network, you know, for film editing because uh, you know I went to uh, there was a, a, a monthly meeting for Final Cut Pro users. Uh, yeah. Uh, down at Ryerson, and that that was really helpful. Those, those sorts of things, you know. Right, right. Um, like a user. But there was not, there was not, uh, no, there was not really a film school. It, you know, to try to learn how to laser laser a, a camera, even. You know, the, the guy he would hope he would tell you how to lace it. Or I did have uh, a, a couple of books that I would read and stuff like that. You know. Uh, right. Yeah. This, and, you know, film, school, film schools didn't even exist, I think, until the late '60s or early '70s. Yeah. Yeah. And and you kind of wonder, you know, because like, it's like going to be like, you know, you're going to learn the whole thing, or you're going to be learn to be a cameraman or a, a camera girl, or you know, I shouldn't, I should say, cinematographer, right? You know. Right. Um, uh, uh, but that's how we used to talk, right, <laughs> back in those days. But yeah, uh, you know. Uh, 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 the uh, the idea of, of of directing, my gosh, you, you've got to you've got to walk before you can run, right? You know, so uh, script writing, being a writer, my gosh, what a, what a wonderful thing to do. I mean, I've I've never really called myself a writer, though. I've written scripts and things like that, and and uh, TV series and stuff. But I've, I've I've got so so much high regard for for writers, you know. That, uh, uh, they they uh, they they need more money for sure. You know, <laughs> right. they don't get, get paid enough. No, I know exactly. They're uh, kind of like weirdly low on the totem pole in Hollywood. You know, even though they kind of come up with everything and design everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're the, they they're the ones who bear the baby. I think you know. <laughs> so, what were your what went through your head or what were your impressions when you first heard about the the project Roar or when you were first brought into it or whatever? Uh, well, I was glad for the job. Again, we, you know, we were sort of in between work, you know, um, it, 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 I didn't get to read the script. I only cut certain scenes, right? You know, there was other editors cutting it. It was a million feet of film. You were one uh, among a, a I was just one of the several editors. And Jan de Bon uh, actually did do some editing. And actually, he was almost like su- supervising us all, you know, uh, and approving proving the edit. And the, the, way, the way it worked was that um, I would be given a scene and the footage, and I, I'd have to cut it. And I, you know, the script is marked up and things like that, you know, uh, with with the good takes and the bad takes and the continuity notes and and you know stuff like that. So I ended up well cutting a cutting a scene uh, just by uh, physically uh, marking a grease pencil, and and uh, then it would go to a bunch of assistants who would cut who would cut the scene as, as according to my marks. If you could believe that, right? You know. Yeah, I know that. I know. Uh, and then they would join it together, and then we would take a look at it. And uh, it was, I'd never worked that way before. I always cut my own stuff, and so that's that was my first thing. I eventually started cutting my own stuff more, more because. But they they had this kind of system where it was like a, a they rented a cinema without its seats, and so they had like I think. Four, four, four machines around. You know, every having a go at cutting this this, this project. 
And uh, you just think this project was like crazy because of all the real, is it lions or it, I can't remember. Well, it was, uh, well, it was, uh, I, I think it was a, a. It's one of these projects that you 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 do as a family, and it was a family a family film. They were starring in it, and they were making, producing it, and they were the direct the guy, the guy was directing it, right? You know, and starring in it too. Right. And uh, so uh, you you could tell that their heart and soul were into the film, and uh, they, I know that Hit, Tippy just you know was a, a great supporter of, of wildlife and uh and they had this this ranch they had in solitaire canyon was just uh, amazing at a a river that went down and then the river got flooded and then the, then, the, then the, the black panther got out and uh the, the director had to go uh, no no marshall had to go and and rescue it and uh uh it was it was like it, it had a lot of torments about it you know um i wasn't Working up there at the time, they were up, the editing room was actually up there, and they, all the, they, some of the machines got flooded and things like that. So I only came in for a short period on that film, um, uh, and edited a few scenes, um, and uh, it was it was kind of uh, a, an interesting experience. I mean, I I've never edited where uh, there's been teams of editors before, right? You know, did it like? I mean, was was it just? Must have been so weird to see footage like that because I mean it's really one of a kind. Yeah, well, I think uh, it was like on a, you know, there was all these. You didn't know quite how you. You had to have four or five cameras shooting this um, at, at the same time, so that was the other complicated parts of it all, right? You know that uh, you had to choose the best bits and how, how would you put it together. Um, and uh, that that made it even more complicated, I think. You know, having, well, maybe who didn't? Because you have, if you've got a lot, lot of wildlife going on, a lot of action going on, having multiple cameras is great, you know. But uh, uh, there was a lot of scenes like that, and that that's what made it quite complicated, I guess. Um, you know, because uh, you had many choices. You can't just you know size down the window like we do now, and then put them all on the same screen. <laughs> Same scene screen, yeah, yeah. But it, it gave me all the experience to work on my, my film and edit my film, and uh, you know, I sort of still had it to to be able to cut drama and stuff like that, you know. And uh, uh, I guess everything you do in life, there's always a, there's always you can always use it again. It's it's, it's great, you know, that uh, the skills that I learned as a young person, I was able to do, you know. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Well, there you have it. It's nice to hear, you know, that people like Wes Craven and Jan DeMont were nice people to work with. And it's cool to see where life can take you when you're kind of pursuing your passion. Well, that's it for us for now. Next episode, we're going to get into it. We're going to get into a song for us, Peter Hitchcock's feature film debut, which is now available on Vimeo On Demand. Check it out at a songforus.com. All right, see you next time.